Shalom everyone, and today we're studying Parashat Yitro, uh, Book of Exodus, chapter 18, verse 1. And Parashat Yitro is mainly around Mount Sinai Revelation. It is a short parasha uh, relatively to the others, but extremely important because this is the peak of human uh, history. Uh, a peak that we never achieved since anymore. Uh, only 72 verses. Whoever listened to Parashat Beshalach knows why 72 verses. Uh, the number of 72, 72 names, we are talking about getting out using the number 72 in order to get out for, of or above the limitations of the physical world. And we have the 72 hinted here in another place. We spoke about it last week. When God is talking to the Israelites and saying, I'm coming here with the cloud. But the word cloud in Hebrew, they have a few words to be used. You can use anan. In this case, he used the word av. Av is again, seven, you can read it as a word, a cloud, or as a number, 72. Okay, so... Uh, so, but what is the real secret of this parasha? Uh, what can we get out of it today, which is a very, very significant um, uh, awareness that we need to achieve, especially these days that are scary, upsetting for most people. A lot of people around the world are really scared because, uh, and it's justified, the world is changing rapidly in front of our eyes, things we thought we can trust, we can uh, secure ourselves with, they're not, they're either they're not there anymore or they're simply dwindling and disappearing into the past and nobody knows what kind of future is waiting for us. So uh, how do we deal with that? And there's amazing message in this parasha. Now, Parashat Ito is divided basically into two stories. Chapter 18, verse 1, uh, we hear about Yitro. Yitro, Jethro in English, was the leader of, a leader of Midian, and he was the father -in -law of Moses. Uh, that's what the Torah is telling us. He was not an Egyptian, he was not a Jew, an Israelite. He was from another, another, another nation, another tribe, Midian. And here, the, the Pasha, although this portion, this Torah portion is uh, talking about the most significant thing that happened ever in history since the sin of Adam, it starts with the story about Jethro, who was uh, Kohen Midian, the priest of Midian, and the Zohar is going to tell us later on, he was the top person in the ancient world that basically uh, had specialized in all ways of idol worshiping, witchcraft, dark magic, any kind of magic. And he is the father in law of Moses. And he comes to the Israelites to visit Moses in the desert. And the thing is, uh, we have to remember, when Moses, when the whole thing in Egypt became really dangerous, Moses sent Zipporah, his wife, and his children back to Midian to her father because it was too dangerous. Having them in Egypt, Pharaoh could have taken them hostage, and the whole story will be totally different when Moses is being threatened every day that his children and wife are going to be executed. So Jethro is coming to the Israelites in the desert, is coming to visit uh, Moses and to bring his wife and sons uh, back to him. That's how the story uh, is starting. Uh, and then just a little bit about what's going on. They, um, they meet there next to Mount Sinai where they're camping. They have a very lovely uh, encounter, meeting together. 
Moses is really telling him all what they went through. Jethro is really happy about that. Verse 9, chapter 18. Uh, he's very happy about the Israelites being saved. And he's blessing God. That's verse 10. Vayomer ito baruch Hashem. Asher itzil etchem yad mitzayim. When people say, you know, bless is God, Baruch Hashem, it's from here. Yitro is saying that, Baruch Hashem, bless is God that saved you from the hand of the Egypt and the hand of Pharaoh. Atayadati, verse 11, Atayadati ki gadol Adonai mikol ha'oloim. Now I know that Hashem, Adonai, Yud Kei Vav Kei, is greater than all gods. Okay? This is very significant. And then, Yitor is, uh, the story goes on that Moses, the morning after, Vayimim Mochorat, verse 13, the day after Moses, after welcoming uh, Jethro, Moses sits to judge the people. Vayashev Moshe Lishpot et Ha'am. Vayamod Ha'am al Moshe min aboker ad Arev, and the people is standing on top of Moses, that's how it's written in, in Hebrew, Al Moshe, mina boker ad Arev, from the morning till the evening. Verse 14, Vayach oten Moshe et kol asher u osel ha'am, and Jethro is asking Moses, what, what is this thing that you're doing to the people? Why is it that you're sitting alone and the whole people standing on top of you from morning till evening? Moses is saying the whole people is coming. Everybody has a questions. What should they do in this case? What should they do in that case? Everybody is coming to know what should they do? <coughs> and I'm the judge. Verse 17, So the father of Moses is answering, It's not good what you're doing. You will surely wilt. You and the whole people. Because it's too much. You can't do it by yourself. You need to have a system, a system of government. You have, should have judges. You should have a system, a, so, a social system in which people are, you know, like running a government. You're not anymore just a prophet in front of a whole nation of running away slaves. You have to create a system. Okay, so, uh, and then it says that this is, How it, then Moses listens to his father-in-law. He divides the people and he creates a social system. The whole nation is divided into groups of 10. Every 10 have a coach, a judge, a leader, a rabbi. Every group of 10. Every 10 of those have also their own teacher, their own coach. And it goes all the way up to Moses. So... Everybody is coaching each other, and that is very significant for the rest of the story. And we, by this, we finish chapter 18. Chapter 19 to the end of the parasha is the Mount Sinai revelation. And here we have a uh, few questions. It says, verse nine, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, mitzrayim, On the third month, to the Exodus, the Israelites came to the Mount, the Mount Sinai, to the desert of Sinai. Midbar, verse 2. Refidim, and they traveled from Rephidim. They had a terrible story in Rephidim that belongs to previous parasha. Midbar, Sinai, they're coming to the Sinai desert. Midbar, and they camped in the desert. And Israel camped in single in front of the mount. And here is the great story. Vayichan, it says in single. In English, you can't tell the difference, but in Hebrew, they, they camped and he camped has a different word. In Hebrew, Vayichan is single, Vayichanu, plural. We have the same word, 
just the words before that, Vayachanu Bamidbar, and they camped in the desert. Vayachanu, and they camped. And then the next word, Vayichan, and he camped, who? Israel. But in Hebrew, it's spelled differently. You don't have the word he. You have that word is inside the, the verbal, the, the verb, the structure, the conjugation of the verb. Vayichan, and he camped, who camped? Israel camped as one person in front of the mount. So what is the commentary saying about it, which is very famous? Rashi is quoting from the Mechit, is quoting, Vayichan sham Israel keish echad belev echad. Keish echad is one person, belev echad is one heart. Uh, and that really explains the rest of the story. Since they were really united as one person, one heart, the sky, the heaven opened up and we had the revelation, Mount Sinai revelation. What happened in the revelation, Mount Sinai revelation? Uh, th that's the rest of the story. Moses came up to, the, to God and God calls him from the mount, saying, that's I'm reading verse 3. And then let's skip. You can read it at home. You have the book, I hope, or on the internet. But this very important verse. Verse 5. And now, if you listen to me and you observe my covenant, and you will be segula from all the nations, wrongly translated in many translations, a chosen nation. That's not the Hebrew. Because the whole earth belongs to me. Now, most commentators are explaining it this way. What does it mean because the whole earth belongs to me? So let me uh, give some, uh, some examples. Uh, let's say this Fono, a great commentator like less than a thousand years ago. Uh, what does it mean you'll be? Uh, Segula, which is again translated wrongly as a chosen nation, he says very clearly, although the whole humankind, all the whole human humanity is very precious for me, from all others, from all other creatures, uh, still you will be segula. Uh, and but that's, uh, you will see that also the same, same uh, thing you see with the Ibn Ezra. And Rabbi Ashlag explains that, Rabbi Ashlag, the uh, founder of the Kabbalah movement in the 20th century, he says, segula in Hebrew, is still being used today when you want a special uh, method, device, whatever, to create success, which means could be from baking a cake and make it rise or uh, anything else that you do and you want to guarantee a special, uh, if you're a professional uh, cue so you can make it work. Make what work? So we know that the whole of humanity has a goal. And the goal is to correct the sin of Adam, overcome all what is negative, overcome darkness and turn it into light, overcome bitterness and turning it into sweet. This is the goal of humanity. However, can we say that God gave the Torah only to the children of Israel because of discrimination. And that's the reason the, the legend is saying 
that God gave the Torah in all different languages. Why? The word Hebrew and Egyptian would be enough. And the answer is, remember that the giving of the creator is infinite. The question is, who is willing or ready? Who has the vessel to receive what the creator is giving? So that depends on the person's uh, course of development along his life, day after day, year after year, lifetime after lifetime. And every time we move forward, our interaction with God's giving is changing. God's giving never changes. Okay, as it says in the book of Malachi that I, I am God, I never change, which means God's giving is unconditional, never changing. Who is changing? We, the receivers, and we receive no less and no more than what our awareness is enabling us to receive. Uh, could be physical bliss, spiritual bliss. It's all about our interaction with the giving of the creator. So we must remember that. Now, so when he, so Rabbi Ashok is saying the word segula basically means that the Israelite nation were the only ones ready at that moment to receive that connection like no one else. Why? Because they took, they were a, a, a fruit of a path that started centuries before when Abram started his journey and then Isaac connect, continued the journey and Jacob continued the journey and then the rest of the, <coughs> the 12 tribes and the most important was the slavery in Egypt. All of that created a, a purification that enabled the Israelites, the bunch of slaves that ran away from Egypt, that they were somehow, as we explained before, they went through the iron furnace. Egypt was the iron furnace. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob started the process, the process of purification. And then the iron furnace purified the dirt in the souls of those people that became, during our story, the nation of Israel. They went through a purification in which Rabbi Ashlag explains, when you want to take the whole Torah, Mount Sinai Revelation, what is the significant? What is the uh, one pillar we can say it's all around that? So we have the two versions of the story. What is the whole Torah about standing one foot? So we have that version from Hillel the Elder over 2,000 years ago. And we have another version by Rabbi Akiva 1,800 years ago. And both are saying one thing, love others as you love yourself. That's from the book of, X, uh, of Leviticus and chapter 19. And it's love others, they say, which means if you want to recognize God, if you want to have a relationship with God, you need to get out of your own self. Human beings, as it states in Parashat Bereshit, Ki yetzer lev adam raminuav. A human heart is evil from childhood. What does it mean? Evil, selfish, which means psychology is explaining to us people cannot really feel others. We just feel others according to our reaction to them. Basically, what's in it for them? What's in it for me? Which means this person that I'm right now interacting with is it going to be a source of pleasure or a source of grief and pain? That's it. And according to our decision about that, then <clears throat> we decide about how to relate to that person and our behavior. It's all about what's in it for me. Very selfish. We, our ability to really feel somebody else without any noise of interest is very limited. Now, 
accepting the idea of loving another human being unconditionally and really being in empathy towards that was very foreign in the ancient world because all the whole of humanity was very, very behind in, in their, <clears throat> in their uh, growth. So because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the slavery in Egypt, and the iron first, which means the pressure, the suffering, and so that the Israelites went through, they were more purified than everybody else. They were ready to receive that idea. And therefore, when they are coming to Mount Sinai as one nation, as one person, as one heart, which means they agreed to be there for each other. And, one, and the, I think the most uh, beautiful symbol for that is the two tablets. Why, why God couldn't use uh, a smaller font and use only one tablet, right? And the answer is the two tablets were given on Mount Sinai on the third month, which is the month of <coughs> Sivan. But the third month means when you have... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, left, and center, which means the third month symbolized the two, the right and the left, the me and the you, joining together into the us. And therefore, the sign of this month is Gemini, the twins, the two who are one. That's why two tablets, two who are one, and the ability, the message of your salvation comes not through believing in a deity, because as Rabbi Ashlock is saying, how can you believe really in a deity that you have no idea what it is? Like, have you ever really seen God interact like, you know, face to face with God? No, impossible. You can have some messages, whatever people do for have feelings and so on. How would you know that this is really what God is telling you? How many times in the history of humanity, people by the name of God, the Almighty, brought so much calamity, atrocities, evil, and cruelty to the world in the name of God? Everybody can realize that this is like, it's not in the name of God. It's what you think God is telling you. So how do I know that God is really telling me that stuff or I'm just uh, having a bad connection and I'm simply getting some uh, interference as an idea? And the answer is Hillel the Elder and Rabbi Akiva are reinforcing the idea from Leviticus that in order, as Rabbi Ashok explains, in order to be able to communicate, to have a real untainted, clear connection to God, you have first to learn how to get out of yourself. So when you care for others, when you empathize with others, when you try to understand other people's pain, sorrows, needs, desires, in an unselfish manner, you're not doing anyone a favor but to yourself. Because when you get out of yourself and you, you learn to get out of your dungeon, you get out of what everything that basically uh, limits us. Selfishness, narrow-mindedness, it's all there. So... The only way we can save ourselves is to get of ourselves, to get out of the limited five senses, state of mind, brain, whatever that is natural, normal, and so on, but it's our dungeon. We get buried in it. We experience death before we physically die. What is death? The Mishnah is telling us Reshaim Bechayehem Nikraim Metim. Selfish people, 
they're dead while they're still alive. How come? You want to connect to God? The real God is the source of life and his endless bliss and love, unconditional, that never changes, that's infinite. Okay, so how can you really connect to something like this when you are finite and limited? Because you're always busy with my needs, my desires, my sorrow, my pain, my traumas, my passions, and so it's all about me. So that's very finite, very limited. We know by the law of attraction, the similarities attract. Can something finite and limited like me be connected to the endless giving of the creator? No, impossible. It's even farther away than water and oil. They can't mix. So how do you connect to that? So our sages are teaching us when we simply learn to love others, to get out of ourselves, we're doing a favor only with ourselves because that's the only way we can finally meet God and really have a relationship with him. And that changes everything. Everything we think about life, about ideology, about love and hate and anything. It could be in business, health, everything. It's all about those relationships. So can somebody really selfish be connected to God? No. As, as the sages are saying, whoever is proud and has ego, God says about him, I can't live with him in the same place by the law of attraction. So how, how would that message be delivered to the world? Only when you give up selfishness. For the Israelites, after centuries of slavery in Egypt, uh, we can't speak about ego. We can't speak about proud because you've been stepped on You've been uh, tortured. You had no rights whatsoever for so many centuries. They just came out of Egypt. They were ready to get the mission, to get the message of loving others. They were the only ones at that time who really could get the idea. And therefore, they are the only ones you can say about them that they could reach that place being as one person, one heart. That awakened the revelation. What do you think God was waiting on Mount Sinai for thousands of years till the Israelites arrived? Say, okay, they're late, they're late. Oh, now they're coming. Let's give them the show. We have to remember, everything we go through was already created in the beginning. It just, we are the ones that by making our own free will choice, evil or good, light or darkness, when we make the choice, we just simply push the button of the next, the next part of the movie that we call our life history. So God is not creating new adventures and new uh, uh, trage trajectories of um, every human's life. No, everything was already created. Everything we can say, think, and do, except for one thing. We can choose to stop the reaction, to stop the negativity, to stop uh, the insensitivity and the selfishness and so on, and rise above the occasion and connect to enlightenment. At that moment, the, the script will be replaced with a faster script, with a script that's leading us in a, in a shorter direction towards our mission, towards our goal. All the scripts are already created, they've already been done. We just choose between the scripts and our sages are saying, Hakol Bidei Shamayim, at the ethics of the fathers, everything is in the hands of the heavens except from 
the R. R is awareness, the awareness, the awe of heavens. When we can achieve that, that appreciation, connection to the awe of heavens, then our selfishness is fading away and the anger fades away and the all the noise of fear, lust, whatever, all our demons fade away because that's the connection. And then we get a new, a new movie, a new script that leads us closer to our goal. How is that connected with the Mount Sinai revelation? When the Israelite arrived as a nation, one heart and one person, and then God's appearing from the heavens, and uh, you can't go through Parashat Torah and doing it every year without reading the Zohar about it. <coughs> Verse uh, 296 in the Zohar Parashat Torah. And it says, and the whole people, the whole nation, see the voices. See the voices? Hear the voices, it should be written. However, we learn it's not a mistake. The voices were engraved in the darkness and the uh, and the uh, uh, cloud around them. Venirim by men could be seen. They saw the voices like you see a physical entity. They saw whatever they saw, and they heard what they heard. Out within that darkness and cloud. They saw a vision. They saw like prophets, and that was shining in a divine vision. It was not physical. And they knew they were connecting to knowledge in such extent that no other generations that followed ever experienced. Verse 297. And everybody saw face to face. As it says, as Moses said, God spoke to you face to face. Who did they see? Tani Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi is teaching us. He's it's not just they saw the voices. They saw behind every voice hidden wisdom. Every hidden secrets of the universe that every generation could ever reveal till the coming of the Messiah. Till the coming of Melech HaMashiach. Amar Bi Elazar, verse 298, in the Sulam commentary to the Zohar, Rabbi Elazar said, Roim, and the whole nation see, as we said, Shirau Mearata Kolotel Mashalod or Tacholim, which means, let me just because it expands, but we, I want to concentrate it. Verse 3, 8, 12. Tanya Rabbi Yossi bar Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi ben the son of Rabbi Yehuda said, Ra'u kan Yisrael ma shalora yichezkel ben Buzi. Each person among the Israelites saw more than Ezekiel, the prophet saw in his revelation. You know, read the chapter 1 in Ezekiel. All the chariots, all the system of the angelic uh Universes and above that. Vekulan idabku bechokmai yonaika and all of them attach to the divine precious wisdom beyond any logic. 
and all five levers. So we know the five levers, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. The fifth level means in total unity among them and the whole creation and the creator. And there's another one. There's more, more descriptions. If you have the Zohar, you should read all of these uh, verses. Okay, and the most beautiful part, verse 342. Lamadnu Shimon, Shimon, when God revealed himself and he started to speak, all the universes above and below started to shake. And the souls of the Israelites left their bodies. 343. Every word came from above, engraving itself. You know, we're talking about what the Israelites experienced. They saw the word coming from above. They saw the word coming from above, engraving itself in all four directions, which we, we can't imagine that because we, we, we're not there. And this word got fulfilled from the mountains of the pure persimmon, which is one of the most precious uh, perfumes in the ancient world. When it mala batalo shalamala and got fulfilled with the upper dew, which means the pure light of life that comes down to give everything life. And then the word came back and they could see the word, experience the word as an entity. And then that word gave them the power to live. Amar Bishimon, verse 344. <laughs> In every word they saw all the secrets of the cause and effects in how the universe is structured. And as the word was engraved in the tablets, which means all 300,000 souls of the Israelites, and it says even the ones who were not there physically, everybody participated, they could see the word with all its meaning engraved on the tablets. And they would see all the branches of, if you do this, if you do that, all the cause and effect, how the universe is basically structured and programmed. They saw everything. Verse 346, and all the generations following, everybody was there. It was a celebration of souls. All of them received the Torah on Mount Sinai. And Moses says that later on, it's in Deuteronomy, whoever was, is here with us physically and whoever is not with us, all of you were present. And each one of them received exactly as their soul should receive. All of them see and receive everything. And our question is, if that is the case, if that is the case, and the Israelites experience that amazing truth and wisdom like nowhere, no one ever after experienced, how come 40 days later, they made the golden calf. How come they continued to sin with the sin of the spies and here and there and so on and so forth? How do you explain it? Do we have hope? Look, we can say here, 
The Israelites experienced such a revelation in a magnitude. Never happened before and will never happen after. And that didn't help. So what kind of hope do we humans help have? We didn't go through the 10 plagues in Egypt. We did not go through seven weeks of walking, marching in the desert. The pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, eating the manna that purified our bodies, coming as one person, one heart on Mount Sinai and experiencing all the secrets of the universe in a super connection. And we still sit if you get the answer. And understanding that will help us understanding many other things. So now the question also have the same answer why the parasha starts with a visit of Hito. Still, Jethro was not one of them. He was a non-Jew. He was a Gentile. He was a Midianite. Why the name of the whole parasha is after him? Okay? You should give him another parasha if you want to give him the honor. But Mount Sinai revelation. So the Zohar is explained to us something that very, very significant, very important. <clears throat> the Zohar will go back to the beginning of the Zohar of Parashat Ito. Verse 9 in the Zohar of Parashat Ito. Tachazay, come and see. Berazat ikdusha yu melech vechoen umshomesh tachtoi. בין לאלה בין לתתה. אית מלך לאלה דיו רזה דה קודש הקודשים ויו מלך לאילה ותחותי אית כהן רזה דה או קדמה דה כאן משמש כמי. ודאי הוא כהן דה קרא יגדו סטרה דה מינה. We know that in the world of holiness and purity there is a king and there is a כהן, there is a priest that is serving under him. And you can see that in the upper worlds and in the lower world. However, we have also, verse 10, When you had, let's say, King David, King Solomon, you had the king, but you had also the high priest. The high priest was not the king. The king was not the high priest. And they were like walking with each other. Okay. And the same way it is in the physical world. That's how it is in the spiritual world. However, verse 11. On the dark side, the other side, which is not the holy side. They were created, the dark side and the light side were created one in front of each other, similar to each other, mirror images of each other, so in one concept that we humans have free will. Which means, if you see power, strength, a king, wisdom, Holiness, power, spiritual power, mental power. In the holy side, you will see also the same structure on the unholy side. Why is it? So you have free will. And that is important to understand. We did not come to this world to be perfect. We came to this world to perfect. We came to have to experience the darkness, the pain, the bitterness, the misery, <clears throat> the limit limitation, hunger, disconnection, in order not to be subjugated to it, but to overcome, lift ourselves up above it, and raise ourselves to holiness. This is the purpose of human life. We Somehow, as a society, in the last decades after World War II, fell into that illusion 
that our purpose in life is to have a nice, comfortable life with, yes, with all kinds of uh, challenges, but everything must be fun. Everything must be within, you know, comfort. There's no place, there's no time anymore for misery, suffering, death, and all of this crazy stuff that was basically part of human life since its beginning. And you know what? It was not even all of humanity. It was really, uh, let's say, the world that we could call the first world, the, uh, in the Western world, the free world, somehow a, a microculture has been created in which all the rest of the world was basically ignored. People still experience hunger, strife, wars, and stuff like this. But somehow, there was a part of the world that thought that this is over already. And the Zohar here is to teach us, remember, when the Israelites experienced and the ten, uh, the, the ten revelations of the ten sefirot of the tree of life, known as the Eser Adibot, the 10 utterances. We were outside our body when we experienced that. You know what? Every night we go to sleep and we have an out-of-body experience. Uh, some of us experience a better experience, some of us less, but once in a while, we really go higher, the soul, and we are out of our body. And you know what? Before we were born, we were outside our bodies and we experienced the truth. So why is it we wake up every morning again? Why is it that we came to be born again? Because in this world, we need to face darkness, cruelty, negativity, uh, pain and misery in order to be able to transform it, to overcome it. And that's what we are here for. In the moment where we try to create, and humanity did make an experience, experiment. How can create a, a perfect world of justice? At least we kind of try to fake it. To create a world that there's no, you know, trying to prevent a child from having traumas and trying to, and to learn to perfection which words to say, which words not to say. Not to hurt every child, even the ones who are experiencing all kinds of whatever. It's a whole culture that was developed in the last decades, decades, in which was basically to create a reality that is free of any kind of uh, <clears throat> suffering and pain. And every parent knows how tough it is when you see that your child has to go through strife, pain, misery, uh, humiliation, you and we try to do everything possible to be there for them so they don't have. And reality hits in you in the face and you realize you can't do that. Because without the darkness, you cannot earn the light. Without the contradictions, you cannot create, as we learned it last week, you cannot create enlightenment you cannot create you cannot create your own connection to god so having this false belief that we humans can create a perfect reality and the most the horrible thing that we can create that perfect reality only with human logic without the need for god that idea started to develop, let's say a few centuries ago. We call that humanism 
all the great philosophers and thinkers that are responsible to the ideology that created what we call the free world. That we can, without the presence of God in our lives, without the presence of enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment in our lives, we can, and without religion, we can create a perfect world free of pain and sorrow. And that became a religion of its own. And the problem is that when you try to create that, you have a little problem. Let's go back to the Zohar we just were learning. So when we speak about the king of darkness, Pharaoh, everyone has his own Pharaoh. When we, came, we speak about the priest of darkness, which is Yitro, Jethro, and everyone has his own Jethro. Each human being, to be a human being, you must have the dark side in you. And you have to be aware of it. And when you subdue, submit, when you overcome those king and priest of darkness inside you, and you break them, then all the other side, as kol tzadim achirim, nichnaim modim lo lakadosh baruch. Only then you are able to recognize godliness, to recognize uh, enlightenment, to recognize the dimension, the real true dimension of spirituality in this world, which is the job of each one of us. But we've been there before we were born. We go there almost every night when we go to sleep. Why is it we coming back? Because here we can create it. We can create it when it's there as a given, as a gift. We can't enjoy gifts. We need to have ownership. We need to go through that that uh, negativity, evil inclination. We need to go through doubt, hatred, suffering, fear, and stuff like this. So we can use that in order to achieve our own enlightenment. So even when the nation of Israel had an out of body experience as a whole nation, it's the only nation in history that had this kind of outer body and continued to live. Okay, I think there's something in the uh, in the Hindu Vedas about a whole nation of three million that experienced that, but they died all of them. Which means you can't just connect to such an enlightenment and come back to your body alive. We did, and what's the result? Did that take a free will away from us? No. Even if you have the greatest revelation, could it, that be more than being a soul before you were born? Tradition says that the child, before the birth of a child, he has an exper is experiencing all the secrets of the universe. And then the legend is saying, as the child is being born, an angel comes and does poof. That's why we have the over dent over here in the upper lip, in the middle of the upper lip, because that makes us forget all of these great divine secrets. Why? Why to make us forget? Because we're here not to experience them. We're here to overcome the darkness, to overcome Pharaoh, to overcome Yitro, Jethro, inside each one of us. That cannot be taken away from us. So the moment we go back to a physical body, we are under the rulership of his majesty, Pharaoh, and his holiness, Yijetro. Both of them are part of our body connection, a part of who we are, so we can really fight for what is right, for what is the light. Without it, there's no life. And how would you do that? 
So the Zohar is going on explaining to us. <clears throat> Zohar, the same Zohar, Zohar of Ito, verse 332. Ditnan, shit mea zinei eita, gaiv oraita levernash. למי ישלים במרי, בגין דמרי בעל או טבע לי בעל מדין ובעל מדעתי. ויתיר בעל מדעתי דעת הנינה כל מה דקודשה בריך הוא השלים לי לברנש. מעינון תוון דזכי בהו לעלמא דעתי ישתלם בהו. מהי טעמה משום דעלמא דעתי דקודשה בריך הוא הווי. Translation. We have learned 313 advices the Torah is giving to the person so he will become complete with his master. Shalem also means to be in peace with his master. Mishum Shad, because his master wanted to give him good in this world and in the upper world, in the next world. And especially more in the upper world, in the come in the in the world to come. Because we learn whatever the holy blessed be, the creator, is completing the human being, it is from that good that he gets to the upper world, to the world to come. And that makes the person complete. What's the reason? Because the world to come is only God's. What does that mean? Here we have another message, the mission. The mission that we believe in only one God. Oh, a lot of people say they believe in one God. The question is like this. Do you really have faith in a God that is only good and he created you for one purpose? To share his good with you that's it there's only purpose one little problem because we have his image imprinted in us we can't take free gifts we get ashamed when we receive for nothing it would be nice little gifts a token of uh, love but you cannot Give somebody success. You cannot give somebody peace of mind. You cannot give somebody uh, <clears throat> a spiritual victory, a real true victory. People need to own those realities, those victories by achieving them on their own. Therefore, our biggest gift is this physical reality with the darkness of the Pharaoh and the priests of On inside each one of us. That part that is the ego, the pride, the, the uh, mix up, the cruelty, the misunderstanding, the fears, all of those host of emotions and thinking and perceptions that are basically the darkness within each one of us. We get them as a gift from the creator so we can overcome them. And then the feeling of victory and achievement and reaching fulfillment and total completion will be ours and ours alone. So we can create the godliness inside ourselves. And how would you do that? So there are 613 advices. Can you command somebody who is created in the image of God? No, the Zohar, the Talmud say, commandment is idol worshiping. Because the moment it's a commandment, there's no dimension of free will over here. So again, when it says 10 commandments, on Mount Sinai, it's a corruption. There's not one Hebrew test, text that says 10 commandments, advices, offers, 
utterances, sayings, it's advices. God can only advise us. He can lift us up <coughs> and experience the heavens and all its secrets. But then we need, we need that to go back to a physical body that is hosting a whole army of negativities and traumas, whatever you call it. And then we have to fight them on our own. The mitzvot, the Torah's mitzvot, like loving others as you love yourself. Like all the other 612, all of them are about one thing. How do we get the power, the energy, the might, the exercise, so we can connect to the light of the creator, so we can defeat those forces and reach completion. That completion is fulfilling God's will. Only one will from God's place to make us happy, to make us complete, to have complete sense of peace of mind and fulfillment. This is God's main power in this universe. In order for that to happen, we need to experience all of those uh, <clears throat> obstacles, traumas, pain, and so on, so we can overcome them and choose the good. That's a victory. That's the only thing we can take with us from one place to another, from one lifetime to another. It's the only thing that gives us a real sense of richness, of uh, happiness, of real true love. That's the whole purpose of humanity. And again, the message was for everyone. All nations of the world, they are all precious to God. Kilikola, the whole earth belongs to me. You guys will bring that message to the world. What is the problem? So you see everywhere around the world, this horrible phenomena calls anti-Semitism. And you always see that the people carry the flag of Jew hating. They're always trying to bring forth Pharaoh and the priest of On, the dark side. And it bothers them. It really, I'm not saying all the Jews are like <clears throat> really messengers of God, but there's a message behind it. And that what they hate is not individual Jews. Anti-Semitism is not individual. It's hating a Jew because he's a Jew. Okay? Nothing because he's rich, because he's poor, because he's uh, like that, because he's, he's uh, religious, is not religious. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What bothers those people? It's a, it's a disease, thousands of years old disease, mental disease. It's all because you can't stand Mount Sinai revelation. The message, the message is there is goodness and it's more powerful than darkness. And the message is everything is being run by one loving, endless God. It's all the light. And he, he sets the rules. You can't make the rules on your own. And these rules are about giving everyone, everyone the chance to achieve happiness, real happiness, real fulfillment on our own. Nobody's to be blamed. Nobody's to be hated. And that's why in long history, we see that every government, every, every school of thought, that adopted anti-Semitism, it was not the only evil thing they adopted. That's only a sign of rebelling against the idea of a loving God. Look around, see the signs, and make your own choices. Thank you so much.